Hey guys, welcome to Snail Mail Tales. That's right, we are diving into the biblical genre of the epistle. It's a letter. Uh, so much of the New Testament is written in this form. And really, you're reading someone else's mail. So we're trying to learn a few questions to ask and a few things to keep in mind when we're approaching these letters in order to get more out of them. So we're wrestling with the question of genre. Yes, simply means the style of writing of what we're reading. You read a receipt differently than you read a scorecard. You read a fiction book differently than you read a textbook. So we're trying to understand what is this genre and what's going on? Today, we're gonna dive into the book of James. Yes, a letter written to whom? By whom? What's going on? Those are the questions you remember from last time. So we're gonna enter this conversation with humility, attempting to get an understanding of what's going on here between the relationship, the author, and the audience, and thus what God is doing through this unique contribution to the canon. You know the drill. Let's check that mail. So you learn a lot from just the first verse. Let's take a look here. It's clear that the author is James, and we see that in their English translation. Actually, really interestingly enough, uh, the word James, the name James in, in is what we read is actually Jacob. I'm not really sure why translators prefer this, uh, what they call an Anglicanized version, but uh, this is the very same James that we're gonna explore in just a minute. That is an important figure in the life of the early church. Who's he writing to? To a diaspora. That's a word that means people spread out across different nations and he's identifying them as the 12 tribes. He sees the New Testament church as congruent to what God did with ancient Israel. That's a teaching point in and all of itself. So what is going on here? You see, we gotta dive into this person, James, first before we can answer that. James is actually the brother of Jesus. Yes, there's some debate about which James we're talking about, a handful of James in the biblical story, but this is most likely the brother of Jesus. I mean, can you imagine being the biological brother of Jesus? Talk about living under the shadow of your older sibling. And it's interesting because he's actually a denier of Jesus' identity to begin with. He didn't really follow Jesus when Jesus was alive. His conversion happened after Jesus' death and resurrection. I mean, who would want to worship their older brother? I mean, come on, you know your older sibling. And it's clear that James takes a place in leadership in the Jerusalem church. As you know, the, the movement of, of Christ kind of began there in Jerusalem at his death and resurrection. And as the book of Acts tells it, it then spread after some persecution to really the corners of the globe. So when we're talking about a diaspora of believers, not only were there Jews who were beginning to believe in Jesus in all of these locations, the New Testament church was growing around the world. Perhaps it's out of this significant leader's authority that he speaks broadly. But unlike the last letter we read where Paul was intimately talking about a church community that he had uh, planted and, and been with, this is a broader letter. It's a letter kind of for everybody, for like the whole church. Last time we talked about this uh, personal and encouraging letter Paul wrote from prison. This is actually a different genre of letter. It's still an epistle. It's called a circular letter. It's when you write something that is intended to be passed around to different communities or sent separate copies to different communities. Uh, because of the broad audience, James is considered what they call a Catholic epistle. It simply means universal or applying to a bigger group of people. Whereas some of the letters like Corinthians, Romans, it's written to those specific church communities. This one is written to everybody. Imagine writing a letter for the whole church. What would you say? The global church, it's a big audience. So what does James, this early church leader, the very brother of Jesus, want to convey about our faith to such a broad audience and even there so let's the skirt let's let's look at this it's even a a certain kind of circular letter yeah we're getting really uh honed in on the issue of genre these uh new testament scholars chung and you uh they suggest that it's a diaspora letter uh, here's what they say diaspora letters are didactic letters that simply means teaching uh, sent from authoritative leaders in the religious center to the communities in the jewish diaspora this was actually a category of letter that was familiar to jewish communities 
across the Mediterranean. Do you guys remember Jeremiah 29? You know, everybody loves to get that tattooed somewhere, right? That God will have plans for you to prosper. Well, it's actually a letter, right? It's Jeremiah's letter that he's writing to the exilic community, this group of people that got carried away into Babylon. And he's writing to the whole diaspora community. You see, you've actually already encountered, if you've been reading the Bible, you've already encountered this kind of letter tucked away into another book of scripture. The issue of genre is just fascinating if you're a Bible nerd like myself. But I hope you'll see that this wrestling with this out is actually has a payoff. It's not just an academic exercise. Hopefully you'll see this actually helps your devotional life. All that being said, th this certain kind of circular letter implies that it is a instruction for scattered people. So let me read again. The function of such letters is to provide guidance for diaspora communities living away from the land of Israel to be loyal to the Lord of the covenant and to strive for the unity of the community of God's people. That's some good stuff. Even then, right? We're talking about a circular letter and it's in specific, it's a diaspora letter. And then even more specific to that, there is another genre that we can use to discuss this letter that these New Testament scholars point out. They call it a wisdom letter. Uh, it places James firmly within Jesus' wisdom tradition. You guys read through the Proverbs every now and then, you've encountered wisdom literature before. It could be a lot of little pieces of advice or things of sayings and, and little scenarios that give you an idea of what you should do in different situations. There's a lot of instruction in here. So think of it like a lot of wise instruction drawing from a shared heritage. James feels a lot like he's telling you what to do? James 108 verses. One finds a total of 55 imperatives, that's commands, plus four imperatival future forms. In other words, guys, there's a lot of instructions here. So I just want to prepare you for what you're going to encounter in the letter that James wrote to the church. He's giving them some guidance. Think of it like this. It's good advice from a wise friend. James is a wise friend helping you in your faith. As they say, the author's self-presentation is as a friend. Yes, he's a church leader. Yes, he has the authority to write this letter and to encourage you in your faith, and we should cherish it like good advice from a wise old friend. He wants his readers to become stronger Christians. This book is about spiritual maturity. This kind of instruction involves socialization, legitimation of a new worldview, and the reinforcement of identity and aims to bring the shared community worldview to progressively more mature expression. So here's how I want you to read the book of James, considering its genre. This is a good letter from a wise friend who is helping you become more spiritually mature. So now that we've acquainted ourselves with who's writing to whom, and his purpose in writing. Why don't we take a moment and read the book? It only takes about 15 minutes, and if you're a quicker reader, I bet you can beat that. But why don't, in one sitting, you give it a try and open up this wonderful letter written to the broad whole church in his day, giving you some good advice about spiritual maturity. Here we go. Just open a new browser, check it out on YouTube. Okay, guys, thank you so much for doing that. I hope you found it rich. There's a lot of imperatives, right? There's a lot of pieces of instruction here. So we're going to try to sift through this. Uh, overall, though, I think if you see that the, the purpose of this letter is for your spiritual growth, it becomes easier to digest some of these things. And it's really a call to a different lifestyle. That's ultimately what James is invested in here. He wants you to live out your faith in Christ in very real ways. So some of the themes that you might pass over as you go through, and you can make a list of your own. Active faith, right? He is pushing you to live out your faith. There's spiritual growth, even through trials. There's eschatological ethics, which we'll come back to in just a minute. There's the inspiration from Old Testament faith. You hear a lot of mention of Old Testament characters. There's the avoiding of pursuit of wealth and status. There's the responding to all things with spiritual discipline. And there's the power of words. What themes do you notice that are prominent in James' wonderful piece of advice literature? What themes do you see in this sermonic letter from James? All right, I'm going to tarry over a few things that I think 
give James a unique place in our contribution of the spiritual life. He has this really intriguing word, double-mindedness. There's a Switchfoot song I really love that says, all of my symphonies in 24 parts, but I want to be one today, centered in truth. That's what the Christian life is like. Do you guys feel divided at times? Do you feel like your attention is divided? Do you feel like your convictions or your intentions, even your very heart, you feel divided? That struggle, James, well, he, he, he talks about it. It's real. Uh, to quote the infamous Mad Eye Moody, he's advocating for constant vigilance. Okay, for anyone who is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he looks like. Do you ever feel that way in your faith? Lack of spiritual growth? James is is trying to help you. Essentially, what he's saying is that without active faith, you are unstable, like waves blown in the wind, tossed here and there. Don't you want to be more rooted than that? And he gives you a strategy talks about it in terms of prayer and repentance, and really, simply attempting to approach God. He says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So guys, if you feel divided, this letter invites you in very real terms back into a centeredness on the very character and person of Christ. There's a Danish theologian named Soren Kierkegaard, and he said, in a book title actually, that purity of heart is to will one thing. So I'll join in John Foreman's prayer. May we be one today, centered in truth. Another special focus. Let's look at trials. It's all over the book of James, this, this interest in how to interpret the hardships in our life. I mean, he bursts into the scene addressing this. So uh, a helpful quote from a professor of mine who was exploring the letter of James in a lecture. He said, impose your theology on your heart. Never deny in the darkness what you learned in the light. I just think that's a beautiful thing. We need to keep this in mind. Anybody feel like they're going through trials lately? Uh Uh-huh, yep. So if James has this almost frustratingly challenging perspective on on trial, and I'm I'm trying to, to humble myself to the wisdom of this old dear friend giving me advice, and it's very hard. He says to count all your trials as joy. Anybody have an issue with that? Yes, it's very counterintuitive. But here's what he says. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. There's actually a couple letters in the New Testament that address this issue. Peter uses the image of smelting, the idea that the trial and the hardship is actually a purification of our very selves. Here, James is talking about it as a way to grow in your faith. If you feel feel spiritually immature, then you're going through hardship. Perhaps that is the mechanism God is using to grow you in his relationship with you. So take it for what it's worth. I'm trying to believe James in this, even as we all go through trials, that what God is intending to do is actually make us stronger, more whole, and complete in our faith. And another special focus, and this one's kind of written all over the place here, and it kind of looms as his perspective uh, on certain issues. It, It kind of jumps off the page in some places. In some places, it seems kind of subtle. But let's just take a look at this quote. There's another scholar who's quoting the scholar that we looked at earlier, so follow me here. James' understanding of wisdom is consonant with the faith of Jesus Christ and stands under the urgent awareness of the coming of the Lord. So if you take a look at James' advice and you tarry over and you realize how much of it is shaped by the realization that Christ is coming back and in a sense of urgency about that, I think it's an invitation to live out our ethical world, what we do, the decisions we make, and how we talk to people, how we think, how we we operate in the real world, if we view that eschatologically. And if you're interested in what I mean by that word, we have a whole series just for you. Check it out. But check this out. Be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. The judge is standing at the door. You see, James views this advice as pertinent, not just because it's good advice, 
but because it prepares us for the, the reality of the coming of Jesus. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared for Jesus? James is inviting you to do just that. So I hope this look at the specific genre of a diaspora wisdom letter meant to circulate um, around a bunch of different churches has helped gain perspective on what James is attempting to do. When James aims, he aims to encourage you to live out your faith in light of the coming King in the here and now. And it's very practical. It has a lot of practical advice, just like tearing through the Proverbs or any of these other uh, passages with a lot of imperatives, a lot of instructions. Why don't you chew on the good advice from a cherished dear and old friend, the very brother of Jesus. And hopefully as we become more aware of how to read these letters, we can gain more out of it. And as James intends to do, grow in our faith. All right, guys, I hope this has been helpful and... We'll see you next time. Godspeed.